So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the third part of our webinar series uh, on memorable teaching moments. Uh, very excited today to uh, be facilitating this conversations with one of our leading authors, Lisa. Um, today's session is uh, climate change and biology, helping students understand how global changes affect life on earth. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Sam Martin. I'm a digital solutions specialist here at Pearson, uh, supporting our digital courseware in the north of the UK, Ireland and Scotland. Uh, but more importantly, let me briefly introduce our presenter and author of our market leading textbooks, Biology, a Global Approach and Biology in Focus, uh, Lisa. So um, after graduating from uh, Tufts University with a double major in Biology and French, Lisa completed her PhD in Molecular and Developmental Biology at Massachusetts Institute of Technology um, in the MIT Woods Hole Oceania Oceanographic Institute joint program. Um, she's published a number of research papers, most of them focused on gene expression during embryonic and larval development in sea urchins. Lisa has taught a variety of courses from introductory biology to developmental biology and senior seminar. And Lisa is deeply committed to promoting opportunities for women and peers, uh, persons excluded due to ethnicity or race in science. Lisa is also a lead author of Campbell Biology and Campbell Biology in Focus. We're very excited that you could join us today. So a quick bit of housekeeping just before I hand over. Um, we've put everyone on mute as they've joined just to make sure that there isn't any accidental background noise or disturbances. But the chat is open and being monitored by my colleague Babi. So feel free to say hi there or ask any questions as we're going. Um, there will be time for a proper and full Q&A at the end. Um, you can use the raise hand button um, during that if you'd like to come off mute and ask any questions. Um, and the recording and slides for this webinar will be being shared by email after the fact. Um, and there will be a second email coming out for anyone interested in uh, staying in touch to see sample copies, demos of courseware or anything like that. So keep an eye on that, keep an eye out for those two emails. Um, and that's it. That's all from me. I'll pass over to Lisa now and we can get started. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for that introduction, Sam. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I have to figure out how to advance the slides now here. Hang on. Oops. There. Um, okay. So as Sam said, I'm the lead author of Campbell Biology, from which the global edition shown here um, is adapted. And also the briefer book from, uh, from majors, Campbell Biology and Focus. I'm gonna be showing some examples from the global edition of biology today with page numbers from this text. Um, and I'm gonna start, uh, first of all, by telling you a little bit about myself and my teaching experience. I wanted to say also that um, I really love speaking with other biology instructors like yourself because I learn a lot from your experiences. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A at the end. So I, um, have been teaching for most of my career at Mills College, which uh, so there's some Mills students shown in these photos. So Mills was a small liberal arts college for women in the San Francisco Bay Area. Just to share some of the student demographics, uh, Mills had about 58% students of color. Many of them were Latinx, uh, a high percentage of first generation students, and many of them coming from high schools that had not prepared them well to study science. I, I'm imagining that some of you might share some of these challenges that I had as well. You notice that I said I, wa I was, uh, Mills College was a uh, small liberal arts college. About two years ago, Mills College merged with Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, um, which is a, a much larger university and their vision is to be a global university. Um, Mills is their West Coast college and I've continued to teach bio general biology to Northeastern students. Overall, I've been teaching the first semester of general biology for 29 years here on this campus, which you can see in the right-hand photo. Uh, we use our beautiful campus and also the Bay Area's great rich diversity of life um, in, as field sites in our courses. And that's what you're seeing on the, on the left, the photos in the left with the students. One thing I've noticed over the years is that students are increasingly concerned about the future of the planet they're inheriting. 
Um, and we biology instructors as scientists acknowledge that global climate change is having a profound effect on Earth's habitats and the life that inhabits them. So many of us see the value of incorporating discussion of this issue in our courses. But it isn't always obvious where in the curriculum, other than in the ecology unit, to bring in this topic. So in today's webinar, what I want to talk to you about is um, I'm going to describe four strategies for incorporating a discussion of global climate change into your general biology course. So the four strategies I, I will suggest in, in, are as follows. First, I'd like to start, I like to start introducing climate change from the very beginning of the course to underscore its importance to Earth's inhabitants and all living things. Second, I suggest bringing up examples related to climate change frequently throughout all of the units in the syllabus, showing its impact at all the different levels of the biological hierarchy. I want you to know in advance that this section, the second section is gonna be the longest section of this talk because I really wanted to give uh, numerous examples of how this can be done throughout the book. The third strategy um, is I find it's very effective to have students work with data, allowing them to analyze evidence and draw their own conclusions. In addition, and related to data, discussing climate change models provides an opportunity to talk about how models are built, tested, and used in science. And then finally, um, I like to emphasize the role of students and the importance of their role in continuing the public conversation because their participation is crucial to any opportunity we have to find solutions that can stop or reverse this destructive process. I look forward to hearing more ideas from you as well. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you have thought about this issue. So let's, let's get going here um, on the first strategy. So my first, uh, the first strategy, you know, the intro introduction to the course can include a, a definition of climate change and an explanation of why it's important to keep in mind. This example, on the, um, which is right on page 59 in the first section of the first chapter of Biology, a Global Approach, in this uh, section right here that's in the box, the term climate change is bolded and defined, along with a specific example of how climate change has been documented to be affecting the distribution of a, of a particular species, shown in the, shown in the uh, figure. So that's just a way to start out. Now for the second strategy, I'm gonna show you some examples of how you can bring climate change in, into the discussion of different topics in your syllabus after introducing it right at the beginning. Okay, so the first example is from the chemistry unit at the point in chapter three where we are discussing the, the properties of water and how water is essential for all life. We probably all refer to the importance of ice insulating bodies of water to support aquatic species. This allows us to bring in the impacts on many species of the ongoing shrinkage of polar ice caps, which is shown in this figure, figure 3.7 on page 96. Second, further on in the course, in the unit on cells and other cellular processes, a subject that most instructors cover is photosynthesis, including the difference among C3, C4, and CAM plants. This is a good opportunity to bring up the fact that these photosynthetic pathways are actually adapted to different climate conditions. And it's important con to consider what the impact of changing climate will have or is having actually on various plant communities. The discussion in chapter 11 of the textbook is complemented, which is shown here on page 276, is complemented uh, on the next page, 277, by a scientific skills exercise um, that has students address the related question, does atmospheric CO2 concentration affect the productivity of agricultural crops? This activity has the added benefit of helping students develop scientific skills as they're guided in making a scatter plot with a regression line. So next, in the diversity unit, while discussing viruses and emerging diseases in chapter 26 uh, on page 624, this is a place where you can bring up the possible effects of climate change on viral transmissions. This specific example shown here 
uh, discusses how mosquitoes, which are vectors for many viral diseases, as you all know, may be expanding their geographic range due to climate change. So the, the evolution unit is a great place to address common misconceptions involving both evolution and climate change. There's a very common misconception I see in my students, which is that organisms can kind of just adapt to changing conditions. They misunderstand the meaning of the term, term adaptation. In this example from chapter 23 on page 557, you can highlight the fact that natural selection can only act on existing variations in a population. The figure at the bottom right shows the great example of snowshoe hares, shown here. Um, these mammals have brown coats in the summer, which allows them to be camouflaged against summer vegetation. And they turn white at, at a time that used to match the onset of the first snowfall. Now the snow is happening much later. So the hares are turning white too early and they are much more easily preyed upon by predators. They can't just adapt because their gene pool doesn't have an allele that apparently that would, would enable them to delay this color change. So this is a really good example to bring up because it's pretty clear for students. Also in the evolution unit, when you talk about speciation, you can introduce the effects of changing climate conditions on the formation of hybrid zones, which are those areas where two species can meet, meet and can interbreed. So the example shown here involves a change that's been documented in the location of the hybrid zone of two species of chickadees that are shown in the picture above um, on page 573. And then this is in chapter 24 on speciation. And this discussion is followed by a problem solving exercise, which is shown below on page 574, which shows why shifting hybrid zones can matter. As students work with data de that determine, to determine and try to figure out whether hybridization between mosquito species could promote insect resistance. So this effectively ties together effects of climate change with impacts on the human condition, pointing out the relevance to students' everyday lives. Now, for those of you who cover diversity, you can bring up the effect of rising sea temperatures on different populations of green phytoplankton, which are very important marine producers. They're discussed in chapter 28 on page 669, along with a figure showing changes in sea surface temperatures and in chlorophyll concentrations, which is a proxy for the concentration of phyto green phytoplankton uh, since 1950. So in a general biology course, Discussion of plants often includes uh, discussion of agricultural crops. And this is a good place to talk about the effects of global climate change on food crops. This passage on page 866 in chapter 37 of the plant unit acknowledges that plants are likely to grow faster and fix more carbon in a warm climate. So faster growth might at first glance seem like a benefit, but the data that are shown that are described are also um, from a, are from a study that showed that while the since the industrial revolution and the ongoing increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide, protein and nutrient levels in these faster growing plants have actually decreased with climate change being the most likely cause. So the nutrients they were looking at in this case were iron, calcium and ascorbic acid among others. So that's a really good point to make for students. Because... <clears throat> So in the animal unit, it's pretty common to mention that seasonal temperature is often an important cue for reproductive cycles. The example discussed here on page 1053 in chapter 45 has to do with uh, caribou populations in Greenland. So these animals migrate in the spring to par particular spots to give birth to calves. And the timing has been coordinated due to evolutionary mechanisms so that the caribou arrive and give birth when the plants are um, when plants are most nutritious and digestible. So climate warming has meant that spring comes earlier, and by the time the caribou arrive and calves are born, the vegetation has passed its peak. It's a pretty another pretty clear example. Okay, so finally, in the ecology unit, it's really easy to bring in climate change. Um, and there's lots of material in the book to support this discussion. 
Here, for example, on page 1204 of chapter 52, which introduces the ecology unit, global climate change is defined again and described in greater detail, providing relevant data. There are many other examples in the ecology unit as well, but I'll end this second section of my talk on embedding climate change within your entire course with a two-page figure that ties together effects of climate change across all levels of biology, which are shown on the, on the next slide. So this um, is the Make Connections figure, 56.31 uh, from the final chapter on pages uh, 1338, 1339. So the first, uh, the first page shows documented effects, um, examples of the effects of climate change on cells and on individual organisms. And then the second page um, shows examples of effects at the level of populations, communities, and ecosystems. So this figure is a great way to tie together the theme of climate change that you've introduced early and referred to multiple times during the semester or course. Another thing you can do is to refer forward to it as well when you're in these other parts of the book. Okay, so now I'll turn to the third strategy, which is on the next slide. So the third strategy is to have students work with data and give them opportunities to draw their own conclusions. The examples on this slide include First, on the left, a scientific skills exercise from chapter 56 that has students graphing data and evaluating evidence to determine whether the rate of increase in atmospheric CO2 has changed over time. And then just before that scientific skills exercise on the page previous is a more detailed discussion of climate change with the data in the graph at the upper right showing the correlation between the rise in CO2 levels and the rise in temperature. So here I'm just showing uh, some more examples of features where students can work on data related to climate change, including two problem solving exercises, the one on the left from chapter 39 and the one on the right from chapter 55. And then there's a scientific skills exercise in the middle from chapter, uh, chapter 11, the photosynthesis chapter. I wanted to show these to bring up some ways that I've found to get students involved in working with data. Sometimes I'll assign these exercises to students in mastering biology so they can do it outside of class. Whereas other times I have them work on these as group activities in my flipped classroom. I've also occasionally suggested to the TAs that if they, they're holding discussion sections that they could use one of these figures to kind of spark discussion and have students work together. So I like these um, approaches because not only are students learning about climate change, but they're also, which is, you know, they're also practicing scientific skills, which is a recommendation of pedagogical researchers aiming to improve general biology courses. And it's also one of the learning goals in my course. It's also important to um, help students understand how climate models are constructed, because you see a lot of those in, in kind of scientific talks and that kind of thing. Modeling is another one of the skills that pedagogical researchers recommending, recommend helping students develop, and climate change modeling is an important tool in understanding and combating climate change. So the graph shown here is figure 5632 um, in chapter 56, obviously. It shows climate change model predictions for average global temperature based on several different factors. So the blue line predicts changes using natural factors only, and the black line predicts uh, changes using both natural and human factors. And then uh, the observed changes are shown in red. And so the students are asked to compare the observed changes, the red line to the blue and the black line to see which one um, you know works, which one matches better. So I, what I would do is to give the students the graph and have them spend some time analyzing it in groups or small groups or whatever. And then I'd actually ask them to answer the visual skills uh, question that you see just below the figure, which asks them to evaluate whether human activities have contributed to observed uh, temperature changes over time. The text on the left also gives uh, a great example of how models of climate change can be built and tested. And, and this one is, it's, this model here is a really great example um, having to do with climate change, because it's really clear that after 1960 or so, models that don't include data on human activities 
that affect the climate, such as how much fossil fuel was burned each year, that type of thing, do a bad job of predicting the observed global temperatures. The blue curve, which is, you know, based on natural factors only, deviates greatly from the observed temperatures, where the black one uh, matches it much better, much, much more, much well, better, I guess. Um, okay, so, you know, one of the things I worry about with um, talking about the impacts of climate change, it can be kind of demoralizing. And, you know, my colleagues feel the same way. It can kind of lead you into a black black hole. So one thing I try to do, and this is my fourth strategy, is to talk about potential solutions and about how students might be involved. This example um, on page 656 from chapter 27 on the origin of eukaryotes describes a study of diatoms showing how they can reduce the amount of CO2 released to the atmosphere. This type of study is something that your students might participate in as future researchers as a way of exploring potential scientific solutions to decrease the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. It's also important to emphasize the need for large scale institutional and governmental efforts um, in order to combat clim climate change, such as, for example, um, sustainable development policies set in place by the country of Costa Rica, shown uh, here on page 1331 in chapter 56. There are also international agreements described, such as the Paris Agreement, also described in the same chapter, in which many countries agreed to set limits on CO2 emissions. Talking about these efforts should bring home to students the benefit of learning about climate change so they can see a role for themselves in finding scientific solutions and or making informed political decisions regarding voting or um, you know, environmental advocacy, that type of thing. In fact, addressing climate change is, is a major topic in the final chapter of Biology, a Global Approach, as you can see in the visual overview on the first page of this chapter, which asks more generally, how can we protect the many species threatened by human activities? So in summary, my proposed strategies for calling students' attention to the important topic of climate change throughout your course are to introduce it early and connect back to it at many points throughout the course, to provide relevant data and always to emphasize the important role of students in continuing the conversation, both private and public, Students realize this problem is not gonna be solved simply by recycling cans and switching out light bulbs. And I found that they're very eager to help. As we biologists know, any functional studies solution, any functional solution requires buy-in from international alliances, from federal and local governments, public and private institutions, and, and in fact, all human beings on our planet. And so my hope is that this webinar has provided some strategies for how we as instructors of the next generation can contribute to solving the problem by getting our students excited and empowered to help solve this important issue. So that's basically what I wanted to say. And I look forward to hearing more ideas from you instructors as well, or to answering any questions. Great, yeah, thanks Lisa, really interesting stuff. So. Um, as we said, we've got some time now for a uh, Q&A. We've got some pre-submitted questions that we can refer back to. Um, is there any any questions in the chat that are particularly burning or anyone wants to come off mute? Just raise your hand if you want to. Um, and if not, we'll jump to some of the pre-submitted questions while you have a second to compose your thoughts. Henry, thank you. Uh... Hello, uh, hi Lisa, thank you very much for, for that presentation, um, provided me with some great ideas. Um, I, I'm an animal scientist uh, and approach the, the topic very much from animal nutrition and, and the role that uh, livestock production plays in con its contribution towards climate change. Um, so so my, my comment really is just, um, much of what you talked about, certainly making the links, um, made me think about new links that I can obviously include in what I do. Um, I'm pleased to say that many of them I, I do mm. uh, include. I, one, one of the things that always strikes me is, um, and I was flicking through Campbell, um, as, as you were referring to the various pages, um, is that when I teach 
my topic, uh, which uh, is not, um, uh, well, it's it's touched upon within Campbell, but it's it's sort of, I always find it difficult to teach using Campbell. Um, and it's, um, so I suppose it's more special, I'm coming, coming at the, the subject from a more specialist point of view. Um, and it's nice, nice to see those um you make those links to the textbook which i guess um my job is to apply them in a relevant way to the topic that i take that that i teach so so it's more a case of of thank you for for um bringing that to my attention and uh whereas uh campbell I shouldn't say this in front of a Pearson's rep, but and an author of Campbell often sits on my shelf, and I don't, I don't pull it off that often. Uh, I will make a, I'll make a concerted effort to do so now that you've highlighted those relevant links and and tasks that I think will be very useful to to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that comment. And I would say also that if you are going to dust it off. And you're going to look through it. I would love to hear because if you look through the animal nutrition section, you may find more ex places where we could put examples. And I would love to hear back from you. My email is right in the front of the book, so please, please do email me and let me know what you think. Okay. No, thanks, Lisa. I'll I'll do that. Sure. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Henry. Anyone else from the chat or want to come off mute with a comment or question? Hi, Mark. Thanks. Hi there. Hi, Sam. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for your uh, introduction. Um, I am currently here at Utrecht uh, University of Applied Sciences, and I teach uh, mostly first year students who want to become not biologists, but biology teachers, uh, mm. uh, high school teachers, wannabes, so to speak. And my job is to teach them uh, chemistry um, for biologists. And I use uh, chapter two to six in my course for that. So that's in 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 contrast to the previous uh, speaker. That's the only thing I use. I use uh, chapter two to six. That's what they need to know for their curriculum. And I'm very glad with Campbell. We we've we've taken Campbell. Uh, I think with all the biology teaching uh, courses in the Netherlands to be as their as as our own bible. Um, what and I, I love the examples that you gave, uh, Lisa. But I noticed there's only one in my section, and together with a few of my colleagues, I try to sort of instead of having dry chemistry as for a whole course, we were planning to see how does that work? Uh, can we maybe switch this chemistry and use global change as? Um, as basically uh, the tree in which all the whole curriculum is based upon mm -hmm. and the whole curriculum for this particular course that I'm teaching. Um, and we haven't able to do so. There are a few items, as you already said, uh, 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 for example, properties of ice, properties of water. Um, we could, I could discuss, um, yeah, certain properties of certain elements that are important in this whole global uh, change phenomenon. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking for more. Um, mm. Would you have any ideas where I could look that up? Or uh, do you have any ideas yourself about that, if you know what my question is? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I know exactly what you mean, because I teach that section of the book, and, and it's really important to make it relevant. I think that idea of making global climate change a theme is mm. a really great idea. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of any more examples, but why don't you email me and I'll, I'll think about it, and maybe we can uh, come up with some more examples and even put more in the book. Okay. I, I welcome any any of you participants, if you have ideas for any parts of the book where we could add more in, please do let us know. We'd love okay, to hear. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much. And Thanks, uh, I'll uh, email you shortly. Yes, thank okay. you. Great. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, anyone else? Oh, 
Oh, we've got a question there from Claire. So uh, alongside teaching, I am a climate change champion for my local authority. A discussion we had recently was dealing with climate anxiety. I wondered mm. if you had any advice of experience dealing with this uh, when teaching. Yeah, I um, I do. I mean, that's kind of such an important question. And that's kind of why my fourth uh, strategy is to emphasize the role students can play. I mean, I think that a lot of young people have really championed this cause and um, have been active, have become activists working to, to change this 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 trend. Um, and so I think connecting to that that kind of grassroots type uh, thinking and the part of students is really important um, because it 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 helps them feel more empowered to do something about it. I, re I really think that's I mean, it is it is kind of a bleak topic and we all feel the same way. So it is kind of a hard thing to know how to deal with. And I really think that the only way to do it is to to try to you know brainstorm solutions or approaches or help students think about you know how could they what could they do you know um that would be that would i mean i really think that becoming informed like you know working with these data and and making sure they understand um exactly the the scientific basis of why we understand what's going on here um, will help them be on solid footing when they go out to say things. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's really, I'm sure you, you have probably some experiences as, as well. Maybe you have some ideas about this, um, but that's, that's what, that's what I have, I've thought about and that's what I've come up with. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thanks. And uh, also just, I think that covers one of the pre-submitted questions we had about um, negative impacts and by the, of, on biodiversity and humanity, how do we give them hope? So I think that covers that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the pre-submitted questions we did have is, uh, how do you tell, how do you tell students to avoid greenwashing? Greenwashing, right? So I really haven't um, addressed this much in my class, but I've got a colleague who's done a lot of work. She teaches ecology, and she's done a lot of work um, with students on greenwashing. And so what she does is she actually has them. Um, evaluate data to determine, you know, to determine whether something is, a, is an appropriate claim or not. And I give you two examples for that. One thing she does is she has them compare electric vehicles to internal combustion engine vehicles. And, you know, the kind of the buzzword around now people say is, oh, you know, oh, EVs, they're, you know, they, they cause lithium mining and that causes a lot of pollution, et cetera. So they're not any better than internal combustion cars. And what she does in her class is she has them go through the data. And she says that the biggest misconception that her students have or that our students have is somehow they have this idea that what we're doing now is kind of at the base level, it's zero. And they're trying to, you know, they're looking at things like lithium mining as a negative effect, which it certainly is. But if you actually look at all the data for electric vehicles versus internal combustion vehicles in terms of what it costs, et cetera, electric vehicles come out as being better for the environment. And she she allows her students to come to that conclusion. So that's one example. And then the other example is that a few years ago, I can't remember which airline it was, but some airline was touting how they were you know, carbon neutral or something like that. And she has them also evaluate that claim and that claim they they figure out is actually not true. So that really is greenwashing. So so that's how I would deal with it in my in my course. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions from chat uh, or anyone that wants to come off mute? <laughs> Thanks, Fabian. Uh, okay. I'd, I'd also be, I'd really be interested in hearing, you know, experiences you've had in class with your students when you've been dealing with this. So if anybody has any, is willing to share, I would, I would love to hear. As a, a question there from Deanne, what about sharing current human adaptation? Adaption, sorry, I can read. Um, oh, that's very interesting. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by current human adaptation. I mean, I guess one thing about 
human adaptation um, is, well, uh, one of the things about, you know, th that we have to let students know is that there's, there's no way we can live on this planet without having an impact on it. So we're never going to get to a zero level of impact on the planet. Um, let's see. Okay. So you're talking about moving away from the sea. I can't see the whole chat thing. Can you see it, Sam? Yeah. Seawalls moving away from the sea is the, the, the follow-up comment. Right. So I think there was also a pre-submitted question that was about this where, you know, with a lot of the low lying levels um, in various countries, it's really a, an issue in terms of global warming, really in terms of ice, ice gla glaciers melting and sea level rising. And it really is important for people to start thinking about, you know, moving away from those low levels because it's pretty inevitable what's going to happen, um, even if we do manage to turn things around. So I think that that's a really important thing. I think what Deanna is bringing up is, uh, you know, this idea that we all have to be aware of what's going on and um, make accommodations for it in some way which is really important. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, we'll turn to one of our, one more of our pre-submitted questions then, if unless there's anyone else uh, in the chat. So um, I guess I, you can answer this in two ways, either specifically thinking about climate change or just uh, in teaching introductory biology in general. Um, but uh, what's your favorite activity to engage your students? Hmm. You know, I, I, when I started teaching 29 years ago, I was clearly a lecturer. I just really thought I was going to open up the crania in front of me and pour all this stuff inside them. And, and clearly that did not work. And, um, you know, over time I looked at data that showed that, you know, if you lecture with no audio visual or anything like that, um, and you test the students 24 hours later, they only retain 5% of what you said. Whereas if you let them teach each other and, you know, do demonstrations and have, you know, kind of multiple media ways of, of it, you know, discussing the information and act and kind of acting with the information or practicing with the information, they can, they can retain up to 90% after 24 hours. And once I saw that, it was a more complicated study, but once I saw that, I really changed my whole approach. And now my favorite thing is when I'll like, ask a question in class and have them talk to each other about it. And you just hear this incredibly loud din in the classroom because everybody gets pretty excited about what they're talking about. I love hearing them, you know, debate each other about the answers. That's kind of my favorite, favorite part. And especially when the teacher next door comes and says, could everybody please keep it down? And I do try to ask them to speak more quietly, but it's really exciting to hear them get so actively engaged in what they're learning. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I think we've got one or two more pre-submitted questions. Uh, anything else from anybody in chat? Nope, doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the series is called Memorable Teaching Moments. So do you have a particular memorable teaching moment that you can share? You know, I, I do have this one student that I, I remember. She really made an impact on me. Um, she had taken my class and she failed it. She came in for help and I suggested that she do, you know, act kind of interact more with the material, like look at the figures, ask herself questions, really try to wrestle with the things that were hard for her and try to figure out what she didn't know. And, um, she heard me, but she didn't really, I don't think she really understood what I was saying. And so she ended up actually failing the course. And then she retook it at a community college. I think she ended up getting a C minus. And she came into me the following year and she told me she wanted to take it again for the third time. And I, I, I was kind of blown away. And I said, you know, sure, you know, it's, it's up to you. You, you can do that. And about two weeks into the course, she got, she came into me and she said, you know what? I finally understood what you were talking about. I, I finally understood that I have to like be much more active in my learning. I have to like question myself. I have to test myself. I have to make myself feel uncomfortable. And I was like, she ended up getting a B and we were both so happy. 
you know, we got together and celebrated her B because she really got it at the end. And I asked her to write up a little thing that she we gave out to students in future years. And you know, I was really uh, so inspired by the student. I asked her, you know, what kept you persisting all this time? Um, and, you know, after taking the course three times, how could you be so persistent? And she told me this really amazing story that when she came to, she was from um, Palestine. When she came to Mills, uh, she was 18 and her brother was 13 and he had leukemia. And she was bound and determined to find a cure for leukemia and to help her brother. And that's what inspired her. And it kind of, um, it, it, it really emphasized to me and, and it reinforced the, you know, the important realization that your students are whole people. You have to like think about their whole lives when you're thinking about teaching them. So that's really a very memorable moment for me. Thanks. That's really sweet. Can I tell um, the follow-up story to that? Yeah. The follow-up story is, uh, you know, I, there's a figure on breast cancer in the, um, it's in the, it's in the cancer chapter and uh, it was redone to describe like maybe 10 years ago to describe these subtypes of cancer that have now been defined molecularly. And the guy I asked to help me with this was a cancer biology researcher from uh, an institute in California. Um, and um, as a thank you for him, you know, four years later, I sent him a copy of the book that he had contributed to. And he wrote me back and he said that um, this student had, that his assistant had brought it into him and it was super heavy. So she was like, what is this? And he unwrapped it. He said, it's a new edition of the Campbell textbook. And she said, oh, that that person is my teacher. And it was the same woman. It was that student who had gone on to get a job in a cancer lab, you know, and was working as his as his assistant. So I, that that just really affected me. Yeah, lovely. Um, OK, we've got a comment from uh, Andrew that's just come in here. So letting students work in teams to come up with small solutions to mitigate some of the problems of climate change uh, gets the active learning going, uh, also helps mitigate against climate anxiety. It's a really sweet, good, really good point. Yeah, that's a really great that's a really great idea. I really like that. Um, yeah, having them work in groups and doing a project like that is, is a great idea. Love that idea. Thank you. We've got one more pre-submitted question, which I think you've kind of already touched on, but maybe you could expand just a little bit. So um, what should elders uh, do to support increased awareness and movement building? Well, you know, I think the best thing that as instructors, if that's what you, I'm not sure what you mean by elders, but, um, you know, if if we are thinking about people that have, you know, are are advanced in age or whatever and have, you know, kind of have been watching this problem develop the best thing we can do is to is, is to kind of help students learn about it learn about the scientific basis of it and i do believe that they have a natural sense of responsibility for the planet and they will take the responsibility to be activists and to really speak out on this material and the more authoritative they can sound the better or they can be actually and so the more we can, the best we can do is to kind of teach them what we know and, and tell them we're sorry <laughs> and we're going to place this in their hands and hope that they can do better than we did. Great. Thank you. Um, OK, um, last chance for any more questions or comments from the chat or if anyone wants to come off mute. Deanne's a great Thank presentation. You. Um, I have a question for all of you. I have a couple questions. One is, you know, do you do you all cover climate change like this in your in your courses? So you could just even put like yes or no in the chat. I was really one curious. yes straight away, a couple of yeses. Good. And um, you know, I totally understand if you can't because of time constraints or whatever. You know, it's really hard to squeeze it in. So a lot of people, seems like a few people do, definitely. Yeah, yeah sometimes. I'm Sometimes I have to skip things because I get behind or whatever. Oh, microbial ecology, that would be interesting. Let me know if you have any um, examples. Mm -hmm. And then um, a another question that I had for everybody, and this is kind of, 
off base, but is is everybody getting impacted by AI? Or I'm not sure if if you know Chat GPT is as much of a problem for everybody as it is in the, as it is in a, in my university. People have any views on that? Thank you, Philip. That would be great. Oh, Henry's got a hand up there. Yeah, I mean, in answer to your question, Lisa, it, um, the biggest impact for me and, and my colleagues, um, I would say, is um, in the setting of assessments. And in a way, arguably, it's having a positive impact because it's forcing us to think of more innovative type questions rather than just regurgitating facts. Um, so my approach is to um, really provide data and 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 get them to think about it and interpret it. So um, setting questions is more challenging, um, but uh, but yeah, um, we we have to think about. Um, the impacts of AI very much so when it comes to the assessment side of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we've got a few comments in chat there as well along the lines of trying to to get students to engage with it as a tool to be used uh, as opposed to a crutch. Can you can you read those? I can't see uh, them. Yep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, we try and use AI as a tool for students to work in assignments. That's from Fabian. Um, and then from Andrea, uh, yes, impact, but we have to let students learn to use it. Um, and then Deanne, I think instructors should use it, uh, use it to recognize typical outputs, responses to AI tools. Um, you'd ask questions, three to four main tools. Um, Julia says, changed my assessments because of AI, e.g. Mm -hmm. no more essays. Not sad about mm -hmm. that. Um, and Mark. At my school, we approach it like Fabian above, especially for teachers um, to be uh, to uh, be. You can use the chat to use on reflection exercises. So again, yeah, using it mm. as a tool. Yeah, so we're kind of wrestling with it at my school, and we have a salon that's like a AI in the academy type discussion every other week or so. And a couple things I would say is one is. Um, I I felt like I needed to give chat GPT a grade last semester because I could tell I I don't assign a lot of essays in my class, but I do assign essays about social impacts of science and um, of of exclusion of people from science and that kind of thing. So we do we do profile a number of of scientists that have come from unusual backgrounds or they shouldn't be unusual, but they are. And. Um, and so students have to write essays for those. And some of them were incredibly well-written, slightly off the point, but incredibly well-written, very well-argued. And so I could tell it was, you know, with chat GPT. And so a few of these students, I emailed them and I said, hey, I'm sorry, I don't know your voice yet, your writing voice. And so could you just tell me if you use chat GPT? And one of them, you know, a student that I really trust, she said, no, that is my writing style. Uh, I didn't use it. This other guy said to me, Yes, I did use it. It's just like Google. And I said, it's it's a source just like Google. And I said, okay, that's fine. Can you just tell me, send me the prompt that you sent chat GBT and also the response it sent back to you. And so he sent me the prompt and he sent me the response and he said in his email, when I sent this to you, I noticed that the response from chat GBT was very much like what I submitted. Would you like me to redo it? <laughs> So it really made me, you know, realize that we need to think about this because there is a value to writing. It's, it's difficult to grade the writing. I'm I'm totally 100% behind whoever was happy to give up the essays. Um, ChatGPT got an like an A minus, very well reasoned, but um, but kind of slightly off the point sometimes. <laughs> and and but I do, you know, I do feel like we need students to learn how to make an argument. And so we have to think creatively about how to use AI. And I asked, I was asking students how, well, I was talking to a student, she's in a class where they have to learn how to use, how to read scientific papers, which is, as you all know, you know, certainly one of the most difficult things they have to learn. And they're first year students that I was talking to. So this, this woman said that it was really hard for her for the first couple papers. And she said, then she figured out a different study strategy. And I said, oh, I'm always interested in that. I said, what, what did you do? And she said, 
Well, she said, I use chat GPT. And I was like, oh God. But she said, uh, what I did was, she said, I took the figures from the research paper and I put them into chat GPT. Maybe, I don't know if you can put images in to chat GPT, but maybe she had chat GPT four or some other one. And she said that she put the images in and she asked it to ask her five questions about the image. And then she answered the questions. And, and so I thought, wow, that's a great way to use it. What a smart kid, you know? Um, and I'm, you know, I, I think that's a really good idea. And I think it is a good idea if they're going to use it to ask them to submit their prompt and what they got back. And then how did they fact check what they got back and whether it was really on point. Grand. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. So um, I think that's probably going to draw us to time then, unless there's any final burning questions that have come in off the back of that. Um, big thank you to everyone for attending. Hopefully you found that interesting and enlightening. Big thank you to yourself, Lisa, for presenting and talking us through your thoughts there. It sounds like you're going to be deluged with emails about what to include oh, in the new text. Email me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and just as a final reminder, um, you'll get two emails following up from um, this webinar, one with the recording and uh, the slides so that you can watch those back and refer to them at your leisure and one with a keep in touch form if you'd like to request sample copies of uh, the book or any of our digital courseware anything like that um, so with that said thank you very much everyone um, hopefully you will have a lovely rest of your afternoon wherever you are and uh, farewell <laughs>